Okay, hi. In this pic, in this uh, video, we're going to talk about intro to biomechanics. So just some basic biomechanics stuff. What is biomechanics? And just kind of getting into um, just the beginning of what we're going to be covering here. So biomechanics is the mechanical principles and physics of motion as they relate to biological systems. Um, so it's a lot of physics, uh, some amount of trigonometry, and a lot of anatomy and physiology. Uh, so you'll notice as we go through this course, if you look at the, the schedule and all the topics and things, there's a lot of anatomy and physiology that we're going to review that hopefully you've already covered in your previous courses. Um, but we're also going to integrate a lot of physics principles um, and use of technology and other things for analysis of movement. Um, we divide biomechanics into statics and dynamics. So statics deals with non-moving or relatively non-moving systems. Um, so in most areas of science, statics usually refers to things that are stationary or not moving. Um, in biomechanics, it's things that are stationary, not moving, or not changing in the nature of their movement. So if they have a constant velocity, meaning that they have a constant speed and direction that's not changing, we would still consider that statics. Um, dynamics deals with moving systems, and that includes the movement itself and the forces involved in the movement. So the forces that are causing and caused by the movement are all analyzed in dynamics. Um, so the whole broad area of dynamics, we divide into kinematics and kinetics. Um, so I'm going to talk about those two in a separate video, and for now I'm going to move on from there. Okay, kinesiology is the study of human movement. Now this is a very broad subject that includes biomechanics and lots of other things under its umbrella. Um, so it's the study of human movement, which is very broad and can include many different aspects of movement. So there's the biomechanics of it, where we analyze the actual joint movements and forces and things like that. Um, there's the anatomy and physiology of what allows us to move. And within that, there are many different areas. Like we could talk about the endocrine foundation for movement and the cellular foundation for movement and muscle physiology and um, there's many different areas within anatomy and physiology um, that we could study in relation to the study of movement. Um, then there are things like motor control um, and all kinds of areas of study. So just any area of study that contributes to human movement is considered an area of kinesiology, and that includes biomechanics. Functional anatomy is another kind of blended uh, discipline. It's another blended area of study. Um, the study of specific functions of anatomical structures, so physiology of specific structures, and how they work to achieve a functional goal. Um, so it's like an anatomy and physiology study of movement, but in a more functional goal-oriented sense. So instead of like like here's this muscle and here are the functions it performs. Let's instead look at here's the function and here are all the muscles that contribute to that and here are how these structures work together and how this joint moves. So it's a more kind of holistic functional view of movement um, in, with regard to how the structures work together to create that movement. Um, so that's kind of an area of both anatomy and physiology and biomechanics. Uh, so we do specifically cover functional anatomy later in this course. If you look ahead in the schedule, um, we'll cover functional anatomy of the upper extremity, lower extremity, and trunk. And so that's where we get into some deeper um, anatomy and physiology of our joints and look at how things work together. Okay, so center of mass, that is important to understand in biomechanics. Um, center of mass is where we have a concentration of the effects of gravity. Um, so we talk a lot about center of mass as we go through different equations and work on different problems. Uh, so if we take um, all three cardinal planes and each one 
goes through us to create equal left and right, equal in mass, then where all three join in the center of the body is the center of mass. So if the sagittal plane cuts through you, so you have equal left and right, um, the transverse plane cuts through you, so you have equal superior and inferior, and then coronal plane passes through you, so you have equal anterior and posterior sides, and again, equal in mass, then the precise point where all three planes um, bisect you would be your center of mass. Um, so we can find the center of mass of anything. So the whole body, um, it would look like what we see in this picture, but you could also talk about the center of mass of one segment, like the forearm or the upper extremity or you know whatever it is that we're trying to find. Um, so in that case, you would just take the three planes and equally um, bisect with equal mass on each side, and that would find the center of mass. Okay, so it represents the location of the average mass of the system, um, and that's also where the concentration of the effects of gravity will be because that's where the average mass of the system is located. All right, the Cartesian coordinate frame of reference. So we use this constantly through all of biomechanics, so it's important to have a good foundation and and to understand where we're starting with here. Um, so Cartesian coordinate frame of reference, we're talking about um, this kind of standard frame of reference that you've probably seen many times in your math classes that include the X, Y, and Z axes. Uh, so when we talked about axis of rotation, um, I think in lecture one, um, we mentioned these briefly, but now we're gonna talk about it from the X, Y, and Z axis perspective as opposed to the um, movement perspective. So in a Cartesian coordinate frame of reference, 0, 0, 0 is the origin. That would be the center of mass in this frame of reference. Um, the x-axis is the same as the medial lateral axis, so the one going in this direction in the medial lateral direction. Um, and the positive side is pointing to the right, and again that's the anatomical right, so the person's right is the positive direction. Uh, Y-axis, straight up and down, superior inferior axis with the positive pointing up. And the Z-axis, the anterior, anterior posterior axis pointing straight out uh, where the positive is pointing forward. Uh, so a frame of reference can also be defined locally with the origin occurring somewhere else. Um, so we could talk about the origin being at the center of mass of the whole body. So we could look at the whole body in the center of mass um, just above the belly button in most people. That would be zero, zero, zero. Or maybe um, the system that we're analyzing is just the glenohumeral joint. Maybe we're just looking at the movement of the ball and socket of the shoulder, in which case we could define the origin zero, zero, zero as being the center of that joint um, or the center of mass of a segment, you know, we can define it however we want. It's all relative. Uh, so it depends on what we're studying, but we would put our frame of reference wherever makes sense for the thing that we're studying. Okay, degrees of freedom. Uh, so you'll hear this term used in lots of different areas of science. Uh, it's referring to the number of variables or parameters that may vary in a system. Um, so that could be uh, the number of participants in a study. That could be the number of parameters that we change when we conduct a study. Uh, in the case of biomechanics, what we're talking about uh, is the number of ways a system can move um, or the number of ways that the motion needs to be described. So degrees of freedom, we could talk about the, the number of degrees of freedom of each individual joint, at each individual segment of the whole system. Um, so there are lots of ways that we can talk about degrees of freedom. So a freely moving segment has six degrees of freedom. So the maximum number of degrees of freedom that a segment can have at a joint would be six uh, because that's movement in each direction in each of three planes of motion. Um, and that would include all of the action that can happen in between those three planes of motion. So there isn't more than that. There isn't a fourth plane of motion. There are only three. And we can only move in 
each direction within each plane of motion. Okay, so for example, the glenohumeral joint, you know, it's an easy one, so I keep using it, um, but the glenohumeral joint can move in three planes. It's triaxial. Um, so that means that we have six degrees of freedom in that joint um, because we can move in the flexion extension direction, we can do add and abduction, and we can do internal and external rotation. Um, so that's two movements in each of three planes, that's six degrees of freedom. So that's the maximum that we can have. Um, and then if we're looking at a whole, like the whole limb, we can add that six plus the motion of the elbow. Um, so let's think about how many degrees of freedom we have in the elbow. We can do flexion and extension and pronation and supination. So of the whole elbow complex entirely, including all three of its joints, we would have four degrees of freedom at the elbow. So if we're adding up our degrees of freedom of the shoulder or just of the glenohumeral joint and the elbow, altogether we have 10 so far. Um, and so that doesn't include motion of the scapula or motion at the wrist. So far, we're just talking about degrees of freedom of only those two, the glenohumeral and then the elbow complex. So we can add the degrees of freedom of each segment to find the degrees of freedom of the whole kinetic chain. If I wanted to add the degrees of freedom of the entire upper extremity, I would be here for a while counting because uh, I'd have to include the scapulothoracic joint, uh, glenohumeral joint, the whole elbow complex, and then all of the many joints that we talked about in the wrist and the hand. Um, so that's a lot of different joints, and we would add up all the degrees of freedom of all of those different joints to find the total degrees of freedom of the entire chain. Um, so mobility is the number of degrees of freedom of the whole chain. So if we wanted to quantify the mobility of my whole upper extremity, we would do that by adding up, counting all of those degrees of freedom of all the different joints that make up my whole upper extremity, and that number of degrees of freedom is how we quantify the total mobility. Okay, a free body diagram uh, is a simple representation of the movement permitted by a system. Uh, it shows the external forces acting on the body and the internal forces acting on the body. Whoops. Um, and we show those using arrows. So we use force vectors, we use arrows in a free body diagram to show in a very simplistic way um, where the gravity is acting on the limb. So we would put the gravity at the center of gravity or the center of mass. Uh, we can use them to show friction. Um, we use them to show where muscle force is being applied to a limb. So basically where muscle force is applied to a limb is where the attachments of that muscle are. So like in that picture you see on the left where we see the biceps, um, and then you see that upward pointing force vector that's showing when the bicep contracts and produces force, its vector, the force vector, is in an upward direction where the muscle is shortening and pulling up um, from where its insertion is on the radius in the upward direction. So uh, the force vectors of the muscle forces are going to be applied to the segment or to the limb where they attach to the bones. Um, and then we can also show a joint reaction forces, ground reaction forces, all, any forces that we want to show all go into this free body diagram so that we get a good sense of all of the forces acting on the segment so that we can figure out what type of lever system it is, where's the mechanical advantage, um, and so on. And we'll get into all of that later on. Uh, so we use a lot of free body diagrams in this class, so make sure you are familiar and understand kind of how to interpret and what, what all these arrows and things mean. Okay, so that's all I have for you for this video, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!